which is the uh, port of great importance to the uh, to missile programs where we load up uh, our missile ships and Polaris missiles uh, on the submarines for tests out at sea. There's a British submarine in right now uh, running some tests with our missiles. This is right at the north end of Cocoa Beach and right across that uh, little strip of water on which these people are camped, uh, which uh, forms the harbor entrance of Port Canaveral, begins the Cape itself. Mm -hmm. Pretty well set up for their bird watching. It's right out there on that point where uh, a few years ago, before the civilian space agency took over and decided on uh, open shots, openly arrived at, mm -hmm. if I may coin a phrase, uh, we used to have to stand uh, and focus our cameras and our binoculars with no information at all from the, uh, from the Air Force, the military, as to when launches were going to take place, uh, just sit out there and wait amidst the mosquitoes. But now, today, those people are tuned, uh, some of them by television to us, others to Reed Collins on CBS radio, we assume, and they're kept up to the moment on uh, how the launch preparations are going. We can tell them that it is one hour, five minutes, and 40 seconds to the 9.32 a.m. scheduled launch. CBS News color coverage of the launch day of Apollo 11 will continue in a moment. One hour, four minutes, and 25 seconds, and counting to the launch of Apollo 11 to send men to the moon, and hopefully to land there for the first time. A great adventure. We're covering here from uh, Cape Kennedy, Merritt Island, and the manned uh, space center here uh, in Florida. Everything is going well. The astronauts aboard, the weather is good. All systems are checking out, uh, and this final stage of the countdown, the recovery vessels are waiting at their assigned points around the world. The mission tracking stations are alert and ready. The radar is ready to lock on to follow man's flight in this great adventure. The flight of Apollo 11 is to be the culmination of a national effort to fulfill that national goal set eight years ago by John Kennedy. It appears to be the most difficult and the most dangerous mission ever attempted uh, since this country and the Russians started sending men into space back uh, eight years ago in 61. When David Schumacher interviewed the crew for Apollo 11, he asked them as they sat behind a protective window to guard against cold germs, about the degree of difficulty expected on Apollo 11. I said in these interviews that every mission is just like the last one, only it's a little tougher. Is this one just like the last one, only just a little tougher, or is, is there something particularly special and particularly difficult about it? Well, I, I think uh, every flight is tough in that it has uh, some new ground to plow and uh, there's always those things which have never been done before and those are the things that uh, that each flight concentrates on and concerns themselves with and tries to assure themselves that they have adequate preparation for handling those things which really are are new and uh, we have some number of new things on this flight uh, I I would hope that they're uh, not any more staggering than, than those that have been uh, uh, attempted on previous flights. Certainly, uh, all our recent Apollo flights have had a large number of new things, and uh, we have just, we have a few. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm staggered about going to the moon, aren't you, fellas? Well, I, we're, we're not apathetic about it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think we have a very good chance of, of uh, completing uh, the landing at this point. We think we have a good strategy and we think we have good procedures and we know the hardware is good because it's demonstrated so on uh, all the previous flights. So uh, we just need now to put all these things together and uh, see if, uh, if we can actual, actually uh, make make the entire enterprise work as, as it's planned. Neil Armstrong, in that uh, interview done a week or so ago with David Schumacher at Houston, 
Uh, Neil Armstrong had a reputation uh, while he was around when he was out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base as a pretty laconic uh, test pilot, uh, uh, a gung-ho one. He always wanted to go beyond the flight plan, uh, apparently. And, uh, but uh, in reporting back, uh, he read the, read the dials, but didn't give them very much uh, uh, the human interest aspect of flight. And we're just hoping that he, he does on this flight for us uh, well, world uh, things down here, terribly anxious to know all of the details of, of flight. Uh, he didn't get much chance to report on Apollo 8, of course. He started tumbling uh, on that flight and, uh, and managed to bring his spacecraft back successfully in our only major emergency in space. I'm wondering if he's thinking about that as he lies up there now on the couch on his back, waiting for this liftoff, checking out all those dials and uh, reporting back to launch control. Uh, uh, things can happen. Uh, I remember, Wally, that uh, I think the most dramatic, when I'm asked what was the most dramatic moment in space flight so far, other than the success of Shepard getting up and, and the success of Glenn getting around, I think was uh, involved you on Gemini 6 when you had a shutdown Indeed. on the pad. Uh, you know, that, that, that probably can't be any worse than that, can it? Well, no, it, it looked like we'd ruined our whole day. And <laughs> <laughs> the decision had to be made in about, oh, I'd say about a second. Uh, turns out you're response time uh, for almost anyone averages about a second. And in that one second, I had to pull together almost every idea I had about what a booster would do and make a decision. Because our choice was the booster had lifted off or it had not lifted off. If it had lifted off and was settling back, we had to eject immediately. Or we'd have been uh, in a rather messy situation at least. And fortunately, the decisions all fell in the right slot. So we came out all right. All of us who've been down here from the beginning of the space program when we were firing these things off and not getting them off the pad knows what happens when you start off the pad and then settle back. That's it. That's a bad day. You're That's right. a very bad day. <laughs> Let's take a look at that. Uh, we've got it on tape here. Well, you've never oh, seen it yourself, I, like I don't look suppose. And there are a couple of comments of mine, I think, on this tape. Let's see if we can roll that. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. Now we've got, we've got a shutdown. No lift off. The engines have shut down. That's a rather interesting day. <laughs> Did you notice the uh, turbine spin up sound there, and then it went off to the roof? Uh, that, that's the uh, the sensation. A rather exciting moment in my life, at least. I don't know, there was still a uh... critical moment. We're watching the fuel pressure lower very carefully. There will be no launch. A critical moment now, getting the fuel pressure down. The oxidizer pressure lowering nicely. malfunction that would have kept the ship from getting into orbit would have caused those engines to shut down on the pad and something did occur immediately after ignition as you saw the engines simply burst once and then shut down an automatic shutdown Elliot C is putting in a call to seven to advise them that we will not have a liftoff Frank Mormon says Roger we saw it we saw it light up we saw it shut down Molly, that was uh, uh, your decision made in a second there or less uh, was considered proof again of your coolness as a uh, uh, as a test pilot, uh, as an astronaut. Uh, you could have ejected, and, and that depart that uh, Gemini Six may never have flown, and you might have had a little trouble getting back. As you did, you read the dials correctly, you analyzed the situation, you took the proper action all in uh, one second. Uh, that is a result, obviously, of, of training. It is that. We uh, we have a device in Houston that we train on that gives us a simulated G. It, it rotates as if you accelerate to give you a slight heaviness feeling. Now, you don't get the same acceleration as you do in a centrifuge, but we go through that exercise many, many times, simulating all possible failures. We call it the what-if world. And if what if this happens, then we go ahead and practice it. 
Well, these, these training sessions were most profitable. It turned out this particular event wasn't in the schedule where it shut down. It was a dust plug that was inadvertently left in, which caused this thing to uh, shut itself down. The pressure came up and then dropped again. Of course, the dust plug blocked the uh, passage of the propellant. That uh, we will never have happen again, of course. Well, it's uh, assumed not, and <laughs> hope not, certainly. Uh, despite this, uh, this great quality control, which is the name of the game in building these things, there are nearly nine million parts of of the command module alone, seven million something command module, nine million in the Saturn rocket. And just think, if you've got uh, just a one hundredth of one percent uh, of those parts don't work, you've still got nine thousand parts that don't work. Uh, it's incredible, the, the, the uh, accuracy with which these things have to be put together.